and welcome to the Moonshots Podcast. It's episode 39. I'm your co-host, Mike Parsons, and as always, I'm joined by Mr. Chad Owen. Good morning, Brooklyn. Good evening, Sydney. How are you, Mike? I'm very good. I'm full of beans, but you officially should be full of beans because you've had your morning coffee and you're ready to go. Well, no coffee just yet, but uh, really? no, it's, uh, it's been a good morning so far. Oh my gosh. How do you do that? I mean, it's literally my first thought. I like just kind of stumbled to the, to the coffee machine. But Cold uh, showers. Oh, Cold showers. You stoic lot. I can't, keep <laughs> up. I can't keep up. But I tell you, what else will wake you up is some good innovation thinking and a brand new Moonshot series, Chad. What do we got going on? Yeah, so we're not only reaching into the world of innovation, entrepreneurship, authors, but we're actually taking a jaunt to, uh, to New England, to uh, Harvard Yard, as they, as they say. <laughs> uh, yeah, straight into, into academia and uh, learning from none other than Clayton Christensen. And it should be said, this guy is right up there as far as innovation authors. In fact, just in general, like as a business guy, this guy is rocking uh, the house uh, he's written a number of landmark books when it comes to business and innovation. He was, he's often regarded as like the father of disruptive innovation. He was polled as the number one most influential business thinker in the world in 2011. He's written a number of best selling books across a really broad spectrum. And he, he is one of the remote, most robust. Bust thinkers, I think we've ever had on the show. What do you think, Chad? Yeah, I, I, I definitely felt like I was going back to school, uh, listening to to a lot of his explanations of the theory of disruption and, and innovation. And I think it's a fantastic. Fr- I'm really kind of disappointed we didn't do him earlier because he he gives all of us a really fascinating framework in and a shared language around how to talk about mm. different kinds of innovation, what they look like, and really trying to decide, you know, is this company truly disruptive or not? Or is this technology truly disruptive or not? So I'm, I'm glad we're, we're getting to yeah. him yeah. Uh, now. I think, I think what's in this for all of our audience is this is, he is one of the most essential thinkers that you should understand because you can apply it to your startup, to your large organization. What he has essentially done is uh, decoded what it takes, what it looks like to be 10 times better uh, than what's on offer today. He's really established, regardless of which side of the equation you're on, what disruption looks like, whether you're the incumbent, large organization, or whether you're the new entrant, the challenger brand who's coming in to disrupt an existing market. And so whether it really doesn't matter which side of the equation you're on, we have ideas and thoughts are plenty for you in this show. And a a quick reminder, where should everybody go if they want to dig up show notes and extra uh, ideas and inspiration, Chad? All of that can be found at moonshots.io. You'll see all of our future episodes, future uh, authors that we're going to be speaking about, Simon Sinek, your your uh, super favorite, yeah. Mike, but uh, also Peter Drucker, kind of a, a, a predecessor of, of, of Clay's. Most definitely. Um, and, um, Eric Reese. And Eric Reese. Mm. Uh, and, and, and even you know, many more. Uh, but you can, you can find all that information in previous episodes at moonshots.io. And one other thing that we're bringing back this time, we've got a book review of, of Clay's first book book that he wrote, The Innovator's Dilemma. And it's a great book that I think everyone should pick up and read. You could finish it in a weekend. Uh, But yeah, we'll be we'll be diving into that book a little bit later in the show. Nice. So where should we start all of this talk of disruption? Where does one begin, Chad? Well, you were able to find a really interesting kind of summary of uh, the core idea inside of the innovator's dilemma and kind of, uh, you know, an explainer, if you will, of, of Clay's kind of general theory of, of disruptive innovation. So I think we'll just start right there. How does a small, young company beat an industry giant on its own turf? 
through what Harvard Business School professor Clayton Christensen calls disruptive innovation. It works like this. Big players focus on sustaining innovation, upgrading existing products and services to attract higher paying customers. But soon, they start to ignore all the regular customers who just want simple, low-cost alternatives. That's where the entrepreneurial company jumps in with that basic offering. The big guys stay focused on more profitable customers and begin to over-serve, adding bells and whistles no one wants to pay for. Meanwhile, the disruptor improves its product to appeal to more people. By the time the incumbent notices, the disruptor has already started to take over the market. The classic example is the steel mini mills, which first produced low quality rebar, then moved to sheet steel, stealing business from the large mills that had been dominant. More recent disruptors include car makers like Toyota and Hyundai, which launched with economy models, then added luxury features and brands. The only way for industry giants to fight back is by launching their own disruptive innovations. To succeed, they must treat the project as a separate unit with a different business model and growth expectations. Ask what job do customers need to get done? Segment customers by job, not by product, market size, or demographics. And develop basic low-cost ways to get the job done. That's how Procter & Gamble came up with Crest White Strips, a cheap do-it-yourself alternative to an expensive dental service. Disruptive innovation creates new markets and reshapes existing ones. To achieve growth in a fast-changing world, you want to be a disruptor. Don't be disrupted. I, you know, that's such a tight little explanation of essentially how business works. This is why, you know, 20 years ago, Microsoft was huge. 10 years ago, Google was huge. Maybe of recent times, Facebook was huge. And maybe someone is coming tomorrow to disrupt them all. We're in this continual cycle of disruption, just like before Tesla, there was Toyota. Um, it's so exciting to, to think that we actually have this author who's sort of framed what I think is probably one of the most essential processes in the way in which business works. And if you're an entrepreneur, if you're thinking about starting a company or whether you actually work in a really large organization, you need to understand this because either you're disrupting someone or someone is disrupting you. <sighs> yeah. One of the, the scariest anecdotes and kind of pieces of evidence that Clay has you know, built over, I think, probably 30 years is so few non-disruptors survive. It's like if, if, you, if your company doesn't either launch a new venture inside or, or acquire a disruptive company, like you're gone, you're toast. Uh, it, it's fascinating. Just it, and it, no matter what industry, you know, whether it was 30 years ago or, or today, if you're, if you're not uh, if you're not tied to or in creating those disruptive innovations, you, you bite the dust. So true. And and you got it in one, like this principle, this pattern of behavior that he found, you're absolutely right. It applies to all, all sorts of verticals and, and areas. And it's, you know, I, I think of it, you think of music, okay? You, you think of great artists, they seem to own a period, and then someone else comes along with a new sound and disrupts them, right? So you see it in all sorts of uh, uh, media types in business. Um, you know, when certain businesses have a dynasty, certain bands have a dynasty, certain TV shows, you name it, it, it is disruption is happening everywhere. And what's so powerful is this show is all about decoding this disruptive process, working out what Clay has discovered and how we can use it too. And I think that what's really interesting is – it's essential. This is clear. Like you have to keep innovating because you will either be caught out, disrupted, acquired, delisted, whatever. Well, not just innovating because he makes a very, and this is, you know, where we could debate the kind of academic. Yeah. I know <laughs> where you're forever, going. Yes. It's a clear distinction between sustaining innovation and disruptive innovation. That's right. Whereas sustaining innovation is, if you kind of imagine the graph of, of you know sophistication of the consumer or customer and the the product features and benefits y y moving into the upper right hand side you know making higher end products for higher end consumers at higher margins 
he calls that sustaining innovation, you know, moving up market in that way. And all and of that, we should note, within your existing business model. Exactly. The disruptive innovation is? Well, disruptive innovation is going in the complete opposite direction. Um, in the, the Crest White Strips example is really interesting because, you know, whereas dentists are adding all these bells and whistles to get you whiter teeth inside of their dental offices, you had to go in, you know, and pay a lot of money in order to do that. Well, Procter & Gamble is like, well, how could we get everyone able to afford whitening in their home? And they created Crest White Strips. And I'm sure that's a multi-billion dollar business line for them. And it didn't eliminate dentists doing doing whitening, but it, it, it created a whole new industry, you know, growing the pie, so to speak. And yes. so that's, that's what he, that's, the, and I'm sure we'll come back to this over and over again, but this subtle distinction between disruptive innovation and sustaining innovation, I think when I read the book a number of years ago, it just completely changed the way I think ab about innovation. And it's a really interesting framework to, to apply to um, all the examples that we have later in this show, but also into to future companies and, and people that we're profiling on the show. And, you know, the funny thing is he, he makes this great case for the need of innovation, but yet the greatest irony here is how hard companies find it to do on an ongoing basis. And this first clip uh, that we've got is him really talking to the process that you have to undergo and what tends to happen in companies, particularly larger companies, how they t tend to kill the very thing that they need the most. So every innovative idea pops out of the innovator's head in half-baked condition, not in the form of a fully fleshed out business plan. And so they then start to put it through the process of getting the support that's required to get funded and developed and launched. And you find out, dang, finance is never going to endorse this idea unless I change the economics so that the margins fit what they're looking for. And then you go through it a little bit farther in front. Boy, this just doesn't fit Ned Johnson's concept of what an innovation is, and so you make it a little more weird. <laughs> <laughs> and then you find out, and this just doesn't, you know, the distribution channel won't, won't push this unless we change this, and so on and so on. So by the time the innovation actually gets introduced in the market, it's been twisted and shaped and morphed, to conform to Fidelity's business model. And very often the reason why companies find themselves that they, they find that they have lost their ability to innovate isn't that there are not good ideas coming in, but it's the shaping process conforms everything to what Fidelity is good at doing as opposed to conforming it and developing a business plan that fits what the market needs. And that's the real challenge. Mm. This is really talking about the the dilemma, and he he doesn't come right out and say it, but um, essentially what he's saying is the way that your business is structured to make money, you know, profitably at as high of margins as you can, mm. you know, running your company well as a manager to maximize the profits and do what you're good at is is exactly the thing that is stifling the disruptive innovation inside of your coming so that that that's the dilemma it's like yes it is every example that he has found through time showed that you know it wasn't bad management that killed the companies it was not not coming up with the disruptive innovations and then no, like you there said were idea yeah. there's ideas are plenty right yeah it's 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 not it's not creating the function inside of or outside of the organization to create that disruptive innovation. Yeah. And, and you know, the, 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 the thing is you and I have worked on lots of projects with really large companies together. And isn't it amazing the effort that we go to, to help them open up and do innovation properly uh, and we, it might be a bit self-gratifying here, but they couldn't do it without us, could they? They need so much help because in the end, when you become large, you become all about managing out the risk. And the problem is innovation is risk. So if you're at a large company, 
it becomes incredibly hard to innovate within inside of the system, particularly disruptive innovation becomes very hard inside. And we'll talk about later how you can address that. But if you're a startup or if you're a founder, just go and look for an entrenched incumbent business that keeps doing the same old things and it will be so hard for them to do something wildly different. There is your opportunity. Yeah, or or even companies that are continuing to move further and further up market. I, I, I think Apple is definitely in this category. They are not. I mean, what was the lowest price point product that they've come out with recently? Like the $300 iPad or, or no, maybe the $400 iPad? Right. You know, you see a, a company like Microsoft with the Surface Go, they're like, no, it's just 300 bucks. Um, which it's not like a huge undercut of Apple, but it's definitely a dig of like, you know, we're going at race to the bottom. Yeah. We're, we're, we're going after the lower end consumer because we want to capture them and, and then we'll continue to make, you know, more and more nicer products for them. Maybe we can get them onto a surface book or, you know, something like that. Um, I'm actually going to skip ahead, uh, to a clip because I think it's a good reiteration of, how how it's it the the same like you're saying like the, the you're driving towards the profit and de-risking it's like th- that's that sounds like good business practices right mm-hmm. it's, but the, the, but mm-hmm. that is the thing that kills them and so he he's got some um, interesting examples here that he uses um, to help explain that and so the question that the management had to address was gosh guys let's sit down here. I wonder if we should make better products that we could sell for better profits to our best customers. Alternatively, maybe we should make worse products that none of our customers would buy that would ruin our margins. (laughs) What should we do? And it is a very, very hard problem, and we call it the innovator's dilemma. Because doing the right thing is the wrong thing, and doing the wrong thing is the right thing. Can you think about where else you've seen this happen where somebody comes in with a simple product going after customers who historically couldn't have access to it and then it just grew up and killed the leaders? Blackberry. Yeah, they just knocked off um, sitting down with a laptop and then Apple disrupted Blackberry. And now um, Samsung and Huawei are in the process of disrupting Apple. That's a good one. Where else have you seen that? Disk drives. Disk drives. The big ones get disrupted by the little ones, and then the smart, the uh, flash disrupted disk drives. And almost all of them are out of business now. Well, I mean, you could add so much to that list. You could say, um, let's see, Blockbuster. Huge and gone. Uh, Kodak, huge and gone. Uh, Nokia or Nokia, huge and then gone. It's, it's quite, it's never ending. And it, it just, it's like this social Darwinism of business, isn't it, Chad? Yeah. Yeah. And it, it's interesting to have an, uh, an academic framework in which to, to view all of these things. Now, while we can fanboy, you know, out about the, the theory for hours here, it's, it's a very great descriptive theory. I personally kind of struggle to see how to kind of make it prescriptive, you know, for me, like, of, of you know, how to do the disruptive innovation, like, because, you know, I guess it's just, it's harder for me to test the theory in practice. Like, it's very easy to kind of sit here and we look at the, the previous examples of, of how it happened. But like, as you were saying, like, to, to do it, it like to do it in the moment it's so hard because of the dilemma mm. because you're just like because like he said he's like oh you know do we make higher margin profits for our best customers or do we make or do we make you know cheap products to uh mass market that we that we're not getting any feedback that they want it it's just like well of course they're gonna yeah to <laughs> to, to, to to move up market well it's it's quite interesting because uh there's a sense in large organizations of, hey, everything is good now. And why, why bother taking a big risk with some, something really innovative? But Clay's like, that's exactly the time to do it when you got cash and you don't have the pressure. Yeah. And we've got a great clip of, of him talking about just that in, in, innovating while you're the market leader because yeah. 
because you won't be for very long. Yep, kick it in. Another thing to remember about these different types of innovation is that it's actually important to start innovating now while the core is strong. And the reason why is that never does the core technology just collapse over a weekend and the new one completely takes over uh, instantaneously. But rather what happens is the core business often is very strong even as the new market disruption emerges over in a larger circle, new customers and so on. If you try to get the core business to go after this new one, then you mess up a good business. But if you wait until the dis disruptive business is dominant, then the core business will have atrophied to the point that you have no resources to go after this. In other words, you've got to start on the new before the old gets sick. And that's what we mean by saying you've got to start innovating now while the core is strong. It's so true. And it's so hard to do because life's good, business is good. Why take this risk? But and the and the twist in all of this is you get to the point where you realize, oh my gosh, we're about to be disrupted. And I would say that if there's an industry right now that is in the midst of being totally woken up to late, it's financial services. Mm. Uh, you know, cryptocurrency, blockchain, you name it, it's all out there wreaking havoc on these guys. And when well, uh, you have direct experience with large financial institutions too, just in your day to day work, right? Exactly. And I can tell you, no matter their intentions, they're working in these enormous organizations that are totally de risked. And there are startups out there who have nothing to lose by totally disrupting the financial system as we know it, how we transact. Uh, you know, where the ledger is stored, the distribution of that ledger or the intermediaries, it is crazy. So here's the thing, don't worry which side you're on because whether you're looking at it as an incumbent, if you're at a large organization, you have to be the champion for change now before you need it. And I think we've cited already a number of case studies of companies that didn't heed that. And if you're on the other side, then look around and say, who is who, who is absolutely stuck in the old model and there you shall find opportunity. Don't you think, Chad? Yeah. Yeah. And I have some examples from his book, The Innovator's Dilemma. But in some cases, you know, while it's not an immediate downfall, like in certain industries, it's only like 18 months or, or two years really before, you know, the, the core business completely, completely dries up. And it, in things like, you know, microprocessors and hard drives, the kind of like the things where Moore's law applies, you know, that that is kind of what made things a little crazy because just the technology was improving at such a rapid rate. I think that innovation curve has slowed down a little bit, but you could you could be sitting pretty and and 18 months later your your core business has has been in the case of the financial institutions, you know, your your core business, every you know, everyone's personal financial transactions have moved to the blockchain. I, mean, I, I don't know if if that's like a two year thing, it's probably more like a five year thing. Hmm. Um, but I, I I don't know of any large f financial institutions that have any at least consumer facing things that are being built on on blockchain technology. Not 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 that you know are publicly known at least to me. Hmm. I'm sure there's a lot a lot happening behind the scenes, but. I think Clay has this great ability to frame that spectrum and that equation. It doesn't really matter which side you're on. So let's kick into this next clip. This, this is Clay talking about the two sides of disruption, threat and opportunity. I have a question for you. Is disruptive innovation, low end or new market, an opportunity or a threat? It's a good question, isn't it? Because almost always, disruption is an opportunity a long before it's a threat. So new market disruption allows you to create new businesses, whole new markets. It's a great opportunity for you. And if you use it as a low-end disruption, it's an opportunity to gain market share 
from the existing players. Later on, as the technology gets good enough so that customers of the core business now start to defect or take customers away from you if you're being disrupted, that's a threat. But almost always, it's, a, it's an opportunity long before it becomes a threat. Mm. I'd, I would like to use kind of the iPhone to, to talk yeah, about yeah, yeah, go for it. threat and opportunity here. Mike, you think that's kind of an interesting little mini case study we could do here? And he, he touched on this kind of when he gave the example of, of the BlackBerry, but it, in a way, the iPhone didn't disrupt cell phones. It disrupted just kind of broader yes. personal computing, yes. whereas before you had to be on a desktop or even a laptop now it could be, you know, his whole thing, like, you know, an iPod, a phone, a, you know, GPS in your pocket. And he just kept like repeating that over and over, you know, when he launched the iPhone, um, because in, while it was still an expensive device, it wasn't as expensive as a laptop or a desktop PC. And then now all of a sudden uh, billions, how many billions of phones have been shipped to date again, Mike, yeah, just that we learned to many <laughs> yeah no it wasn't it two billion iphones have been shipped yeah, since, and, you, and you're like since hang on there's not that many people in the world like where has <laughs> everyone got like three of these yeah i mean i don't think you can say well i know that you can't say that for any other personal computing device and i know that's kind of maybe a stretch for like what an iphone is but yeah it that it it that's where and, and apple was really the only one that that saw it as an opportunity and spent the time and money and effort and research and development because you know, they had turned the company around. They had the the cash in order to do that, and then everyone else was like, w- w- had to see it in the light of you know a threat. It's like, oops, yeah. you know, we missed the boat. Now we've got to catch up. Yeah, and well, what was if you frame that and we zoom out just one more step back in the day, Nokia was the bee's knees. Everyone had a Nokia, and you mem- do you remember playing Snake on your Nokia? And that was like, oh, yeah. that was the go to interaction. And then the BlackBerry came along, and then it was all about having email on your phone. And then it became about the iPhone, which was about app stores and no keyboard. And all of that happened in poor, oh, I think I would at a stretch say that was 10 years. We saw three cycles of disruptive innovation. Uh, yeah, or maybe even shorter. I know, crazy, huh? It was like, like- I mean, like it was 99 2000, or 2000 to yeah. 2007, yeah. 2007's iPhone, so, so you know, there you go. So it shows you how quick it goes. But I think what's really in this for our listeners is if you understand it, you can time your product. You can time your service design. You can think of a new business idea with this in mind. So you can think, hmm, where's somewhere, which is this old economy, like, Honestly, Steve Jobs sat there and said, oh my gosh, everybody's doing it wrong with phones. We've never made a phone, but we're going to get in there. And I think this is so brilliant. Who would have thought back in the day that Blockbuster would be bankrupt by a DVD um, by mail provider that then became a online streaming provider? Like the, 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 the reality is when you're in an industry, there's this group thing that happens and it's because everybody just does business the same way and, and, and it becomes, uh, you know, all about profits and de-risking and no more risk taking. And so it's not necessarily about the technology itself. It's this underlying thinking of disruptive innovation and understanding the different models. And what Clay's opening up to us is if you think differently about the product and service, and you can serve the pains and gains of your customers or what he calls the jobs to be done. Mm-hmm. There's a world of new business opportunities sitting there if you're willing to see them. Yeah, so I want to go back to your Netflix example. So everyone out there, just think of Netflix having disrupt Blockbuster, but they had the foresight to stave off disruption from the streaming services and create a completely new service within the company. And now streaming had been done before. It wasn't a new technology, but they applied a new way. They essentially created a new business within Netflix in order to capitalize that. And and Clay has some really interesting things to say uh, 
about disruptive technologies versus technology or versus disruptive business models? Because in many ways, I made a mistake calling the phenomena disruptive, disruptive, because there's so many connotations of the word disruptive in the English language. And so there are a lot of people who call anything that is a dramatic improvement or a, a, a breakthrough, we call it disruptive, and that's not true. So almost always, disruption is built within the business model of the technology, of, of the enterprise, not by developing the best technology. So typically, you can take a technology and deploy it onto the California freeway or on a, for, a corn field in Iowa. And how you deploy it determines its disruptiveness. And that's really an important one to do. And people say that I'm a Jewish mother of business in that I'm always worried about everything. Uh, but I worry about you guys, you know, because I think that you are very good at developing potentially disruptive innovations. But I don't think you're, you worry nearly enough about the business models that you have to build that would then take your technology into an application that competes against non-consumption. And I think that's a very important concept, and I don't think I'm totally wrong about that. Mm, those yeah, are some, yeah, yeah, yeah. Some your brain fun. sort of starts to melt as he's talking about that, doesn't it? Well, and he's talking inside of Google. So when he's saying you, he's saying like, you, Google, I'm not quite sure that you're thinking about disruption in the right way. Again, taking Netflix as an example, DVDs had existed. And Blockbuster, in fact, was renting DVDs to people. It was the yes. business model innovation of, well, let's just charge $7 a month and we'll just mail them to you and you can get unlimited DVDs. That was the disruptive innovation mm -hmm. on the part of Netflix that they then did just a few years later um, to get into the streaming game where they're like, well, we've got the streaming technology. Let's just, let's just turn on the switch. Let's flip the switch that everyone that has our, our DVD service also gets streaming for free. And then hmm. you know, they quickly found that ooh, there was one misstep when they tried to, you know, spin it out as uh, Quickster, Flickster. That's it. Well done. Yes, that <laughs> um, was the misstep. Yeah, that was that was the blip. But Reed mm -hmm. Hastings quickly learned. Oh yeah. Um, in that, uh, and was you know able to to write write the ship. But I don't want us to lose this important distinction of Clay and his theory of 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 disruptive innovation. Really, is focusing on the business models not just the technology. Like it's, it, I think in a way it's okay. business models and technology, but it's, it's just not, it's not just new tech. Yeah. So let's just go a level deeper now on Google. I think this is so relevant to our listeners who are, who are trying to come up with the next Google. Um, I would propose this. If you follow Clay's thinking, Google are an amazing example of business model innovation in the world of advertising. If you were to try and pinpoint one thing that they have done better than anything else, it's not that they have a box and you type in and it gives you pages, okay? What it was is that they were able to democratize advertising mm -hmm. and to show highly relevant advertising and make uh, and package advertising up so anyone and everyone could buy ads. And this is the source of so much pain for Madison Avenue right now because they've been disintermediated by Google and Facebook because they've come in and offered a different business model of advertising that used to be the pure playground of the traditional advertising agency. So I think that the, more than anything, it's a business model innovation. Whereas if I look at jumping over to sports, if I look at the All Blacks, you know, the most successful sporting team in history by any statistical standard, they have a culture and an organizational type of innovation. Uh, if you look at the iPhone, the iPhone is a customer experience innovation 
that went on to subsequently disrupt a lot of businesses as well. Well, so the creation really of the app store for the iPhone too is oh. is is a, is a huge business model innovation. We touched on this in our our Steve Jobs uh, episodes. Yeah. But yeah, and, again, and wasn't it amazing that he, he he didn't originally want the app store on the phone? Mm-hmm. Do you remember? Mm-hmm. He wanted it only to be Apple product, uh, uh, Apple apps. Yeah, well, that was, that would have been a a multi billion dollar mistake. Oh my gosh! Oh my gosh! So yeah, I I think there's there's a lot here, and and I think the the caution sign here is just because you've got a good piece of tech doesn't mean you've got the whole answer. Do you have a way to monetize it? I think is the real lesson in what Clay was giving us there, don't you think, Chad? Yeah, and where the tech is entering into the market, because he would say if you're creating, if you're creating, you know, a better mousetrap for your best customers, that's only sustaining innovation. Like, yes, that will build up the core, it will sustain your business, but it's not going to create a wholly new market that disruptive technology does. And we have some really great clips in the second half of this show where Clay's talking to specific, you know, contemporary companies, you know, whether he considers them, you know, true disruptive innovators or maybe just sustaining innovators. And uh, so be sure you stay tuned uh, for those case studies. We, we're with, you know, he talks about Tesla and Facebook, uh, Toyota. Um, and he he's and he's quite challenging on some of our favorite companies. It was a bit like oh, he was uh, pushing and prodding at at and questioning, you know, really how good they are at innovation, which was just so cool to to hear. And you know, he has quite some <clears throat> shall we say critique for our friends at Tesla. So there's so much more to come from Clay, and I, I hope everybody is like tuning their heads around this idea of what innovation looks like, why it's so hard, why you have to do it while you're strong, or if you're on the other side of it, if you're looking into the marketplace, look for those who are refusing change. We talked about financial services who are in the midst of that right now. And whatever you do, don't just think that tech is the answer. It's actually the business model too. And that's what we can take from from Clay. And, and as Chad rightly said, in the second half of the show, we're going to look at all sorts of examples of that. And, and it feels like a, a revisit to our Hot or Not show, um, uh-huh. but it's going to be super exciting. But even more exciting is the return of a Moonshots classic, the Chad Owen book review. Yeah. So the innovator's dilemma, it's, uh, like I said, it's a really, it's a really deep dive into everything that you've heard so far on the show it's kind of the root of of clay's thinking and he you know since has kind of is branched out and applied similar frameworks and in slightly modified frameworks in in many other arenas even kind of you know in into uh, his and our personal lives you know when i think i think mike you had found um some stuff around his book um how you measure your life where he kind of, he takes these theories and he's like, well, what happens if you look in the mirror and apply them to yourselves? But it all started um, with The Innovator's Dilemma. It's it's the only book that he wrote by himself, kind of based really on his his research um, at Harvard. And so it, 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 you know, it's kind of pure clay, if you will. And if you can stick with the academic, uh, nature of the book because it's so thoroughly researched. I mean, I, I loved that part of it. Um, it's so, so thoroughly researched. It, all the examples and case studies he, he give are, are kind of like irrefutable yeah. evidence of the validity of the theory as, as applied to those industries. And it's, it, for me, it's also kind of like a fun little time travel because he, you know, he talks about the steel industry and the, and the like 14 inch hard drive industry, which I didn't even know was like a thing, you know, like in the- <laughs> back in the day. And, you know, but then he, you know, he comes forward and it's funny, the, the second to last chapter, I think of the book is kind of a thought experiment of him in the nineties, um, talking about electric cars and, and how, you know, electric cars could or couldn't become a, you know, a disruptive technology and industry, um, you know, quite, quite prescient, you know, t- 20 years 20 years, you know, before the likes of Tesla arrive on the scene. Yeah. I'm curious, Mike, what was your, what was your first reaction uh, after having made your way through the book? 
Well, to to me, what I related to a lot, uh, because I spent a lot of time in the last decade working with really large corporations like GE, uh, Microsoft, a lot of them, you know, when uh, and sometimes I was on the disruption side, uh, particularly when I was doing Xbox and, and you know, creating products with GE. And, and other times, uh, I felt like we were on the receiving side of the disruption and we were trying to counter that. And I felt like great clarity in explaining this this cycle that we go through, the ups and downs, the peaks and the valleys of, of business. And um, I, I really related to that. And I found it such a concise framing of, of, of the patterns that we've been talking about. But I do have to say, Chad, that I am going to go as far as saying that how will you measure your life had an even bigger effect on me. Mm. It's uh, how, how how so? Because I, I watched the TED talk and I kind of got it, but like it wasn't enough to to draw me into the book. So I'm I'm very curious. Okay, okay. So the way I can uh, frame this a little bit is, uh, as you know, um, I spent uh, quite a long career in working for very large advertising agencies. So DDB and McCann Erickson, two sort of granddaddies of Madison Avenue. And, you know, I was very fortunate, traveled all around the world, did some great, great stuff, met wonderful, wonderful people and, and, and just had a blast. And then I kind of went back to school in early, early 2013 and said, I want to build products. And that, that journey was triggered by a Tim Ferriss book, which was um, not putting your life on hold. And I, I felt this calling to build products, to learn more about innovation. And I kind of jumped in and then I got, I already knew the innovator's dilemma. And then I got the book, How Will You Measure Your Life? And it came around at the right time and he was just using the same frameworks and systems and methodologies to rather than put innovation and achieving amazing things, instead of putting that lens on the business, he put it on the individual. And uh, he tells this amazing story. I'm just going to digress for a moment, Chad, but it's worth it. That's all right. Okay. We're, we're now in the Mike Parsons uh, book review. Okay, okay, okay. Sorry. So, so, so he tells the story of, you know, he was, um, you know, he was a super student at, at, at Harvard. He's now obviously a professor there. And he would go to the reunions. And, and every couple of years, he started to notice that people went from extremely happy, successful. And he said in his class... At one point, I think it was either the 20, 30, or 40 year anniversary reunion for the alumni. He had three people that were in his class that had actually been to jail. One of those was, if I get this right, Jeffrey Skilling from Enron. Mm. And he was like, when I, when I went to college with this guy, he was nothing but the most forthright, honorable, good person, and something went wrong. And People lose track. And I, it was such a compelling story. And I was like, wow, that was really powerful. And the framework that he presents is so perfect in a context of work always tells you where you are, how good you're doing. Every day, you either do good, average, or poor, and you know it. Whereas life, relationships, family, and friends, it's a softer thing. It's more ambiguous. It's more abstract. And the benefits are often earned over a long period of time. So you have these large periods of not knowing, not getting that, that, that clarity of feedback. Anyway, he presents this whole universe of how to apply goals and how to be the best person you can be. And it is one of my favorite all-time books. And I thoroughly recommend it to anyone. It's called How Will You Measure Your Life? It's Admittedly, it's a bit outside of our normal spectrum. But if you are just on a mission to be the best you can be, read that book, Chad Owen. All right. I'm adding it to my, uh, my Audible list. It's pretty fab. Pretty fab. It just, uh, again, to, to touch back on An Invader's Dilemma, it's, it's a quick read. You could read it in a weekend. I think I blasted through it on my Audible in about three days. <laughs> um, my, my dog walking and uh, commuting. Good man. And... If up to this point you have been skeptical, maybe, of this theory of disruptive innovation, after reading the book, you will be a complete convert. Yeah. Um, and so to, to kind of help 
bring home all of you maybe skeptics on this theory of maybe you're questioning like, am I doing something that's truly disruptive? And maybe, maybe you aren't, maybe we aren't, right? I think turning this, turning this more critical academic lens onto to innovations, um, a really fun and interesting exercise. So I just want to like jump right into some of these case study clips yeah, go for that it. we have here. And i um, going to start with uh, him talking about retail. And uh, of course, you can't talk about disruptive retail without talking about Walmart. Some people say that if you want to be innovative, you have to accept lower margins. It's not true. But with its, if it's disruptive, the, the formula by which you calculate profitability is different. So um, over the, the, from 1960 to 1990, retailing went through a massive disruption. As the traditional department stores were disrupted by, uh, in America, Walmart and Kmart, and uh, several in Europe were doing the same thing in foods, Aldi is disrupting the world. So but let me go back to America. The department stores, the way they made their money was they had to make gross margins of 40%, and they turned their inventory over three times every year. So 40% times three equals 120% return on capital invested in inventory. And that's the way they think. When Walmart came at the bottom of the market, their gross margins were only 20% but they turned the inventory over six times every year. So 20% times six equals 120% return. And so they get the same profitability, but with a different formula. And that's what you have to worry about. If it fits your profit formula, then you can do it right in the mainstream organization but if they have to make their money in a different formula to be disruptive, then it has to be separate. It is so true, Chad. Like you cannot go into this large organization that is risk-free, managing and operating with great excellence. Every- and tell them to cut their margins in half or by third. Yeah, or, or they're running like Swiss trains, right? So everything's running nice and smoothly. Everyone's trained. They've managed the risk out. You don't walk in there with a bunch of post-its and say, guys, let's innovate. Woo! Like it just doesn't happen. It's such a cultural misfit. You have to do, uh, you know, the original Lockheed Skunk Works idea. You have to take a small team and you have to take them far away from that, from that mothership and put them in a safe place and say, guys, be autonomous, be fast, be agile. Here's your money. Make a, solve a problem, go for it. It really is critical because even Astro Teller from, from Google X talks about, you know, people who are climbing the mountain in the everyday business, when you turn around and want to do something different, it's fundamentally a different mountain to climb. Fundamentally. Well, different. it's, yeah. And it, it's not just this cultural thing because there's going to be the, the shareholders and the stakeholders in the business that, if if you're reporting out quarterly earnings that are, I don't know, 8%, and then all of a sudden you, you say, well, nope, everyone, we, we got to cut our quarterly earnings to 4%, your stock price is going to tank. Yeah. And so that, that's what he's talking about, where it's like, there is a there is a formula inside of your business for how you make money. And if this innovation fits within that formula, great, you've got a, a good sustaining innovation. But the, the true disruptive innovations, he says, is like, where the business model is fundamentally different, that formula is very, very different. And again, that's where you're faced with, with the dilemma <laughs> as a manager of, the, of a big company. It's just like you can't afford to; it's too risky to go, you know, down the market with for for lesser margins. But you know, as the retail industry saw with Walmart, like it's now a I don't know seven hundred billion dollar company yeah. you know it's just like well it worked <laughs> yeah it's so true it's so true and and the i think the learning here is that do not expect disruptive innovation using traditional business models and 
approaches. If you want an exponential result, you have to take a radical approach in order to get it, you know? Yeah. And that, that we had, we've kind of touched on this in several previous, previous shows, even the, the last show with Brendan about if Facebook is going to continue to be a true innovator, might they have to spin off something like Instagram, you know, Mm. and Instagram be that, you know, truly disruptive innovation if it's under, if, you know, if it's fully incorporated and under the guise of Facebook and, you know, accountable to, you know, the penny pushers at, at Facebook. And so we've actually got, I got a great, another great clip here. Um, of Clay talking specifically about Facebook and Google. I'm not sure I yet feel like I can put a crown of innovation on the Facebook folks and say, you're innovative. You know, I think what we can say is they came up with a great idea, I think based on a job. And they've been executing on the idea, you know. But yet, I don't think they they have developed another great idea. And I think inside of themselves, there are probably all kinds of really neat ideas bubbling up. But I will then say, oh, they've innovated twice when they show their ability to innovate in the creation of a different business model. And then if all of these ideas are coming up and they do it a third time, then I think I might like to think These guys are an innovative organization as opposed to they had a great idea. And in a similar way, I I pray for Google. Mm -hmm. Great ideas, but they got really one successful business model. And innovating to create the new business models that would deliver the, the ideas to the market in the right way, I can't really say that on that dimension of innovation, I can I can say, holy cow, these are one of them. Yeah, well, you know, he's very he right. Kind of throws a wet blanket on. <laughs> <laughs> Gee, there go there goes two of our shows, actually, mate. Um, oh, just just wait until we get to our test. I know, I know, I know. Oh, there goes the king of the show. The, so, look, the, the the interesting thing here is. You know, he's certainly right when he says uh, Google has only done one thing, and that's obviously AdWords slash search. It's a vast majority still today of its profits. It's obviously got it, the everything else bucket, lots of interesting things in it. But it's fair to say that none of those have really taken off yet, and it's fair to say that they're taking longer than uh, obviously the original search product did. I think um, the you know the interesting thing about Facebook it was preceded by many other social networks trying to do very similar things. So I would say much like Google, they came along and did something brilliant, and they applied the ad model to it and made a ton of money. I mean, in Facebook and Google, you they, these two companies alone are fundamentally reshaping the advertising and media industry. You can argue your degrees of are they innovation or not, and he's very right. Neither company has done it twice, and that's truly the the big test. And I don't know that Facebook has even done it once, if you're applying his theory. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's that's fair. That's fair. Uh, His theory, yes, that's fair. They didn't change a model. They, They took an ad model similar to Google's, and took a product similar to Friendster or Coot and a million other different companies that had done that before. Yeah, but I, I think I think the innovation was more on the product side and the marketing and go to market strategy side of things. Go to market, not, not the business model. Yeah. The the ad, yeah, the the you know the, the the advertising, the monetization model, like it was not disruptive. I think if you're going to call yeah. Facebook, you know. A disruptive innovator. It was around, you know, how they started at Harvard. Yes, campus and by then campus, other college campuses, yeah. and then high schools, and then and then everyone's mom and dad were on. Yeah, and certainly they scaled. They scaled so much better than any other tech company of recent yeah, times. What's coming clear to me after having finished the book and listening to all these clips and and many hours more uh, <laughs> of clips that that didn't make it into the show. One, I'm going to be much more careful about using 
the word innovation, innovator, and, you know, disruptor or disruptive, and certainly like really careful with using the term disruptive innovation. (laughs) Because I think, I I mean, we have a show here, Mike, where it's called Adventures in Innovation. And we throw the, the word around all the time. And I don't know how much care and thought, you know, we have brought to it. Uh, I mean, yes, we have, but like, I think it, it would maybe, we would be doing ourselves a service if we were a little more careful and kind of critical in how we're using the terms. And I think for me, the distinction is like calling, calling Google and Facebook like an innovative company, like, Clay's like, well, they, they innovated once, right? You know, they, they had the disruptive innovation once. So calling them like, you know, a disruptive company or an innovative company like today, like isn't true. Like Google did the innovation 18 years ago and has just been writing, (laughs) has just been writing that into the, into the sunset with continuing sustaining innovations. And so again, that's just, I think that's my reflection as we get here to the end of this show, like, you know, one thing that I'm going to to do a little bit more is be careful how I use those terms. Well, you've certainly, what I think you've really been bringing to the show is the distinction between sustaining and disruptive. I mean, you opened up with that and I think that's coming back so strong, isn't it? Yeah. And it's, it's, a, it's just a very interesting f- framework. Like I, I love systems and processes and frameworks. So I, I'm one really excited that we have three more authors with even oh more gosh. theories oh and frameworks gosh. to, to, but- to, to go but through. before we get to them, we've got the ultimate in automotive showdowns and we've got Clay's thoughts on it. So let's dive into the world of Detroit versus Japan. This is Clay Christensen talking about Toyota and all those big automotive companies in Detroit. Toyota came in with a rusty little subcompact in the 1960s called the Corona. And... Uh, it was so much more affordable and accessible that the rebar of humanity, people we call college students, <laughs> could own a car. And uh, generals, and so they came out here by making it affordable. And in the back plane, uh, General Motors and Ford were making big cars for big people. And people would see Toyota coming in, and Toyota went from a Corona to a Tercel, Corolla, Camry, Avalon, Forerunner, Sequoia, and then the Lexus. And as Toyota would come, were coming up there, going after new customers, um, they'd say, you know, we ought to go get those buggers. And so they'd design a Pinto or a Chevette and try to sell uh, subcompacts into the marketplace. But then their finance people would look at the money that they could make in subcompacts with the profitability that they could make making bigger SUVs and bigger pickup trucks to even bigger people. It absolutely made no sense to defend the low end of the business when they had the opportunity to make good products better. Uh, Who's killing Toyota? They don't feel like they're getting killed, incidentally. Yeah, the Koreans are just killing them at the low end. And uh, and Toyota's doing the right thing, because why would they ever try to defend the low end of their business when they have the privilege of competing against Mercedes at the high end? And then the Chinese manufacturers are coming next. And we seriously don't need to worry about them. <laughs> He gets a little facetious there at the end, but uh, it, it's really, it, that I think is a great kind of summation of, you, you were talking about like, there's these cycles mm. that we can see. And I think that was just to me a beautiful illustration that he walked us through. Yeah. And, and you know, the, the, that, that evolving cycle, you know, as I said before, we, we talked about it in, uh, mobile phones and smartphones. We talked about it in music. We talked it about, now we're talking about automotive. And, and it's so fascinating because everywhere you look, you'll see this and you just now need to look around yourself now. All our listeners need to do is think about, okay, what are the, what are the things in my life that are ripe for disruption? What are the things that just won't change? And I, I think another industry that comes to my mind is what 
you know, the Netflixes, the, the Amazon Primes are all doing to the cable industry is akin to what, you know, Napster did to the music industry 10, 15 years ago. The, the, this cycles all around is just be on the lookout. And I think if you're like Richard Branson, you carry a little notebook and you look for things that problems that you have and then look for the incumbents behind it that are not changing and there's your business opportunity. Yeah, just write down all your frustrations yeah. on a chalkboard like Richard Branson. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. But, I mean, for all of his thinking, he ain't finished with the automotive industry quite yet, is he, Chad? No, but it's it's interesting. At the end of kind of all of these talks and, and things that he's given in, he's answering you know questions from the audience, everyone's always like, well, what about this company? And what about that company? And so... You know, we've heard him talk about Facebook and Google and, and, and Toyota, but you and I are both fans of Tesla. We both and, and Brendan gave it a, a, a hot mm -hmm. yeah. on the, yeah. uh, on the hot or not meter. And, um, Clay has a, a slightly different view of things, but, um, I'll just let him speak for himself and then you and I can, uh, unpack what he says. So the theory would say that, uh, Tesla, is a sustaining innovation, right? So they come in at the high end of the market and uh, they're deploying it in a very demanding application, which is the California freeway. And what the theory says is that they might be able to develop the product that is the best in the world, but if they go after the best customers of the leaders up there, these guys are going to harness whatever they can and they will do their best to knock them out or they will acquire them. So they, in, in a lot of ways, you could think of disruption as a theory of competitive response. If I do this, what will the competitors do? And when Toyota came in with the simple product, the theory predicts that, that, that Detroit will just ignore them. And so what's happened is, yes, Tesla is the best with the best product, but Porsche has spent a billion dollars, and they have a completely uh, oh, electric car now. And you can just smell BMW all around them. And so the theory might be wrong, but the theory would say, that these other guys are either going to kill Tesla or acquire them. That's what the theory says. And Christine and I were in Beijing uh, four weeks ago, walking down the road, and here is this electric car that was as wise as me. And if I had a passenger, I had to fold her up and put it in the, <laughs> the b b boot, you know. And it costs $2,500. And uh, that's where I think the transforming technology will come from. Mm. Mm. What do you think of that? He's proposing that democra democratization, that almost IKEA-like approach to, to automotive is the winner. Very interesting. Yeah, well, I think... If you are an adherent to and believe in the application of his theory, then I think he's kind of right. Mm -hmm. And Tesla, you know, we talked about Elon's plan with with Tesla. You know, like Elon knew that that the that the Series Three was coming, but really from the beginning, he's like, you know, I got to get the Roadster out there and test it. I got to get I got to get the the S out there, and then you know, like we're gonna get to the kind of Every, quote unquote, every man's mm -hmm. electric car. Um, because what he was, I think what I, n now that we're looking at it through the lens of, of, of Clay's theories, I think what he, he was for, he was trying to resolve the dilemma by like forcing these subtle kind of business model tweaks mm -hmm. as we went along. You know, he's like, okay, you know, we, we test it all along the way. And then eventually that'll get us to, because he needed Tesla to, make the money to continue on like again he's kind of working under those constraints that clay's talking about of how like you know you have to make money and be a profitable company and have a good core you know to be able to fund these sorts of things or you have to be kind of a complete startup and so elon was like you know what i'm gonna 
incrementally or sustain, sustainingly innovate my way to the disruptive technology. Whereas Clay's saying like, look, there's a Chinese company that's coming out with a $2,500 electric car just like from the outset. And that's maybe a more true disruptor in the yeah. electric car category. And, and obviously the, the recent bumps that Tesla has had really does, the journey was never going to be like smooth sailing, but they're really entering some, some tough times and I'm I'm sure there's every opportunity that you know they'll look back at um, their current times in a year or two and say, well, that was a bit rough, but it's all good. But right now, Tesla has a lot of debt, and so acquisition is not such a crazy topic. I mean, he's you know well documented trying to raise uh, a couple of billion. From the Saudis, I mean, geez, you know, a BMW acquisition right now would 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 really, honestly, not be that that earth shattering, would it? No, and and one thing that um, we haven't heard from Clay in today's show, but it's definitely in the book Innovators' Dilemma, is again going back to the distinction between disruptive tech versus disruptive business models. Often, or in most cases, the the disruptive technologies are developed with inside of the large incumbent organizations. And it's a different company or business unit entirely that takes that disruptive technology and then applies it to what they're doing. So yeah. this Chinese company that has this $2,500 car could, I'm guessing, could not have made that without the battery technology that Tesla has pioneered. So again, in a way, like Elon's kind of grand vision for the company was like, you know, creating this big company that you know, had to make money in a certain way. And then to, because to, I think really for him, it was all about batteries. He's like, look, we got to get the battery technology going. And like, here's how I think we can make some cars to make that happen. But he's, he kind of like created the technology that could potentially be okay. it, its own demise as maybe, I'm not predicting, but like, it's certainly a possibility that, you know, the a Chinese company could come out with a $3,000 electric car that, um, you know, that I'm taking to and from uh, my work here in New York or you're hopping to and from your uh, workplace there in Sydney. Yeah, it's um, – and, and, you know, the funny thing is what's really fun is weighing up, is it disruptive or sustainable? Which side of the, the disruption are you on? Are you doing the disrupting or are you getting disrupted? The one thing I'm feeling is that I'm walking out of this conversation with such a clear – of what are what really takes what radical approach uh, you really need to take not only in tech but in terms of business model if you want to really disrupt that seems to me so powerful in what we've taken out of the the show and you know you flagged it right from the beginning Chad very appreciative of you it really is a big distinction between sustainable innovation and disruptive yeah innovation. and disruptive technology versus disruptive business models yeah uh again these kind of they're very you know very simple diagrams that you can that you can just jot down on a post-it and kind of keep next to you you know where you and i are, are looking at different companies and, and innovators here on the show and then you know as you the listener are hearing about the the latest and greatest you know from silicon valley we we now have some frameworks for some fun thought experiments. Not only th fun thought experiments, I, I think you're also quite right in saying like this raises the bar for us. You know, are mm -hmm. they really meeting that that criteria? Is it is it? You know, look, uh, it, what did he say? You've got some neat ideas and some smart ideas, some great ideas, but to to really meet his standard, the gold standard of disruptive innovation. Uh, he's quite clearly raised the bar for us. And I think that's great. What a great way. Uh, and this, I think this is what the author series is going to do for us, is it's just going to put a lot of rigor uh, and a lot of refreshing frameworks, ideas, and methodologies to apply to a whole new set of entrepreneurs in the show. I'm, I'm pretty pumped for that. Yeah, so who do we have next, Mike? Well, I mean, if if Clay doesn't meet the granddaddy description, then Peter Drucker will and peter drucker is huge and enormous in the world of business he came a few decades prior to clay but i will tell you that uh, and i think i've mentioned this before on the show he he has this thought that you know essentially product innovation and marketing are only two things that really grow a company the only two things that really matter 
And it's really one of the key influences that inspired me to build my entire career around those two practices. Mm-hmm. So product innovation and, and marketing. And, and he had so much uh, great high-level thinking uh, like that, but also a lot of uh, very practical advice about how to run meetings, how to be an effective uh, executive. He is such a prolific uh, author and his body of work is profound. Uh, I, I, phew, I have no idea where we're even going to start <laughs> sourcing clips for Drucker. Holy smoke. But we'll, 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 we'll come to that problem tomorrow. But I am so excited for Drucker. Yeah. And behind that, we've got Eric Reese and Simon Sinek, uh, and some, some fun kind of alternate, uh, format shows, uh, akin to Hot or Not. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, and Mike, do you want to, Give a shout out to, to any of our listeners or tell them where they can find all that information. Look, I think obviously jump over to moonshots.io. I wanted to give a special shout out to all the people that have been following us on Instagram. Just uh, search away for Moonshots Podcast. You'll find us there. We've got quite a nice little group of people jumping in there and sharing thoughts. I love all the quotes. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, you're, you're, you're the social media manager for the podcast, <laughs> Mike, but uh, I, I, I do make an exception. Uh, to my to my no social media hang on, hang on. world to uh to go and check out. What's hang on, there. did we did we just get a confession that you Chad Owen are actually using Instagram and social media? Is this truly happening right now? I just want to make sure. I, can someone write this down? Okay, so this is this is like how backwards and much of a luddite I am. So I I literally go to moonshots.io and click through to our Instagram. So I'm, I'm experiencing Instagram in exactly the wrong format. He's doing it on a desktop it's, browser. It's not on my phone. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. That is too perfect. That is just too perfect. Well, listen, um, what a, what a, what a fun show. Um, what a challenging show. What a, what an inspiring show to, to get our heads around. None other than, than Clay Christensen. Whew, Drucker to come. I mean, geez, this one will be big. He is honestly, he's Drucker is right up there. In my mind, he's right up there with uh, Steve Jobs in terms of absolute heavyweights for the show. I mean, I'm pretty pumped for, for Peter Drucker. What are you expecting from, from Drucker and, and what we can learn from him? Oh, I, I, I think what we're doing here, Mike, is kind of building up the uh, like moonshots, a library of frameworks and and things for us to use going forward. So I'm, I'm just excited to see uh, what new lenses and perspectives that we can get from, uh, from Peter Drucker to add to our toolbox, you know, that we got from, from clay today. And then, you know, again, with, with the other authors that we're profiling. Mm. So I'm really excited. Mm. It's like, uh, we're going back to school here at the end of the summer. Big time. We got summer school going on. Uh, thank you so much, Chad, for, just being on this journey with me, it's just so much fun to get into this. And it, it is really crazy every time at the end, we're like, geez, I learned so much. Geez, I learned note to self. Like, but I, I think you really call it with. That's what innovation is all about, though, right, Mike? Yeah. Like, it's all about the learnings. So here we are. Yeah. Practicing what we're, we're, we're preaching and saying, hey, how, how, how can we learn? Yeah. I was, I was talking to somebody the other day and, and I said, basically, we're performing learning out loud. <laughs> yeah, I like right? that. We're just learning out loud and we, we hope everybody who's listening is enjoying it. Don't forget to head over to moonshots.io, pick up all the goodies, head to the Instagram or your social media uh, channel of choice. Chad, thank you. Thank you to our listeners. It's been awesome. Um, I hope this has pumped you up for your day in Brooklyn. Are you feeling ready to let rip? Oh, yeah. Very good. I think now's the now's the time for my cup of Joe. Ooh. Now's the time for you to to make it back to the the fam. I'm guessing and oh man, and turn in they've, for the they've crashed, man. I'm I'm going home and I'm 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 like the code word is be quiet. Don't don't stomp around the house. <laughs> Just be quiet. Don't wake everyone up. Um, so I'll, I'll I will creep in there and I'll see everyone in the morning and and all that kind of good stuff. So it's certainly been a fantastic show. So thank you. Make sure you do check out all of the show notes at moonshots.io. We can't wait to have you on the next show for Peter Drucker, one of the granddaddies of business management. So that's it from the Moonshots podcast. We'll see you next time. That's a wrap. <laughs>